Islam is misrepresented in the media. Islam is a religion of peace, peace to humanity. It does not only talk about peace, it demonstrates practically how peace and universal brotherhood can be achieved. We have one common parents. And our creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, almighty God, is one and the same, one and the same. We have well-known and prominent speaker, Dr. Zakir Naik, who needs no introduction. He will be giving a lecture on the topic, Peace, Vision of Islam, Why This Event? Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah, wa ala ali ashabi ajmain, amma baad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقل جاء الحق وزاك الباطل إن الباطل كان زهوكا إن الدين إن الله الإسلام رب شهلي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه كولي My dear brother Yasir Fasaga brother Zakir Ahmed brother Jeffrey my respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. I have been given the present task of the inaugural speech and talk about why this event. Peace, a vision of Islam. Today, we find that on the international media, whether it be the international satellite channels, the international newspapers, the international magazines, the radio broadcast stations, there is virulent propaganda about Islam. Islam is misrepresented in the media. The main objective of this exhibition, Peace, a Vision of Islam, is to present the correct picture of Islam, to remove the misconception from the minds of the human beings. And I started my talk by quoting a verse of the glorious Quran from Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, which says, وَقُلْ جَالْ حَقُّ وَزَاكَ الْبَاطِلِ when truth is heard against falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It is also derived from the word silm, which means to submit your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is Almighty God. So in short, Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to Almighty God. And anyone who acquires peace by submitting his will to Almighty God, in Arabic, he's called as a Muslim. The misconceptions in the media, especially after the 11th of September 2001, has reached epidemic levels. And we find that this religion of peace, that is Islam, has been labeled as a religion of terrorism. The main objective of this conference is to present the correct picture of Islam. As you might have read the brochure, there are various pavilions, there are various events. One of the major Islamic exhibitions consists of about 275 posters. The main objective of these posters 
is to present the picture of Islam so that the human beings have an urge to know more about the religion. When you read the newspaper, there are headlines. If the headline is attractive, the person, he reads the newspaper. And when you read an article, the first paragraph, it is a synopsis of the article which holds the attention of the reader. If the first paragraph is not attractive, the reader stops reading further. So the first paragraph should be attractive so that the reader is compelled to read the article further. So these posters mainly, the objective is to serve as headlines or the first paragraph. The details are mentioned in the various books which are also exhibited in the exhibition. For example, one of the posters it mentions, today's gospel truths, number one, Muslims are terrorists. Number two, a four-sided triangle. Number three, the earth is flat. Number four, two plus two is equal to five. These are the gospel truths today. We know that how can a triangle have four sides? Four-sided triangle, it's opposite. Similarly, Muslims are terrorists. Muslim means a person who acquires peace by submitting his will to Almighty God. So how can he be a terrorist? These are opposite. As opposite as a four-sided triangle, as untrue as the earth is flat, as wrong as two plus two is equal to five. These posters serve as headlines so that you can read more about Islam. There are various sections. One of the sections in these posters is of women in Islam, the women's rights in Islam. And one of the posters, it speaks about the hijab that is the modest dressing for a woman. And the points are described in brief. There are basically six points according to the Quran and the Hadith. How a woman should be dressed, the complete body should be covered, except the face and the hands up to the wrist. These many scholars say also should be covered. The second is the clothes they wear. It should not be so tight so that it reveals the figure, it should be loose. Third, it should not be transparent. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And sixth, it should not resemble and be a sign of an unbeliever. In the talks that will follow in this mega event, Peace to Humanity, there will be many international speakers coming, even speakers locally, who will be giving talks on these aspects, and how to convince regarding the modesty, the hijab, dress code of a woman. Just by giving example, suppose there are two twin sisters, both of them are very beautiful, equally beautiful. And one twin sister, she is wearing the Islamic hijab, a complete body cover except the face and the hands up to the wrist. And the other twin sister, she is wearing the Western clothes, the mini skirt or shorts. And if both of them are walking down the streets of Chennai, and if round the corner there is a hooligan who is waiting for a catch, who is waiting to tease a girl, I'm asking the question, which girl will it tease? Will it tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab, or will it is the girl wearing the mini skirts or shorts? But natural, he will tease the girl wearing the mini skirts or shorts. As Allah rightly says in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 59, that, O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the believing women that when they go abroad, they should put on the cloak so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. These posters that are exhibited, about 275 in number, they act as headlines. Many of them, they contain verses of the Quran. And besides the English translation, it also contains the translation of the regional languages. There are models, about 25 models, which present the two pictures of Islam 
For example, one model is of a Quran, and the verse mentioned below is the verse of the Quran of Surah Baqarah, chapter number two. Verse number 208, which says, Oh, you believe, enter into Islam wholeheartedly. Because if you want to enter into Islam, enter wholeheartedly, not just partly. And the Quran has got various commandments. And if a person only follows a few commandments, it is not appropriate. And the model shows that the Quran has got several strings and one rope where all the strings are joined together. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, wa wa la Hold the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. We have to hold all together the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and enter into Islam wholeheartedly. If you only follow one aspect of Islam saying that, okay, I will give charity, but I will not pray. I will not perform the pilgrimage, the hajj. It's part of Islam. Or the other person may say that I will perform the hajj, but I will not give charity. Allah says in the Quran, Almighty God says, that you have to follow completely. So if you hold the rope, the complete rope, all the commandments, then only will you get the true peace in this world and in the hereafter. We believe that we should not convey the message of peace only to the elders or to the adults. We should see to it that we introduce the message of peace right from the childhood. And we find today that in this materialistic world, the way our children are being misled, we have to take care of our children. It's the duty of every parent to see to it that they give the proper atmosphere to the children. Today we find that the satellite channels, which has many children programs, we have video cassettes, we have films on the children, we have cartoons, all of these, they don't actually convey the message of peace. And most of them, they speak about violence. That's the reason. There are psychologists in states and in the European countries, they say the maximum damage done to the child is the programs on the satellite channel. And there are various articles we read that a child in the third standard, he sees all these violent movies. Once he has an argument with his school friends, he takes the gun of his father and he shoots a couple of them. All this has been instilled in his mind by what he sees. What a child sees, it becomes part of his nature. When we tell to the people, the children, that they should not see such violent movies, or movies that take you away from peace, we have to present them with video cassettes which talk about peace. There are various Islamic cartoons and animations which present the true picture of Islam, the true picture of peace. And it inculcates in the child the nature which makes him peaceful. We have got various cartoons, various animations, especially catering to the children from the age of 3 to 12. There are audio cassettes for children. And most of the audio cassettes that are there for the nursery level and for the pre-primary level, they don't have a message. For example, I remember in school we had learned the poem, Ba Ba Black Ship, have you any wool? Yes sir, yes sir, three bags full, one for my master, one for my dame, and one for my person who laid down the rail. Then we had Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Fine, these have a certain message, they teach you new words. But you find, while you're being taught new English words, we find that the basic message, Jack and Jill, is talking about a friend, a boyfriend and a girlfriend going to a hill, or Baba Black Sheep talking about a dame. In that a child gets programmed that fine, it's good to be with girl, girl and boy can be together and they can enjoy, have friends. In fact, our children should get the proper message of peace. 
There there are audio cassettes, Islamic audio cassettes, songs such as various songs collected from different parts of the world, from states, from UK, from Singapore, from Malaysia. It speaks, for example, I am very strong, I am very strong, I love Allah, he is my best friend. Anyway, my voice is not good. I hope Brother Yusuf Islam was here. He would have given a better demonstration. So these poems and Islamic songs, I am very strong, I love Allah, he is my best friend. So all these, besides a child learning new words, he comes closer to his creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are various songs, for example, the children of the world, where it shows how Islam brings all the various children of the world from Africa, from states, from UK, from Singapore, from Malaysia. How does it get them together? There are songs which speak about animals. They are Muslims too. So let's watch what we do. Let's do what we can for the creatures of Islam. Here, the child is learning that the animals, they are also Muslims. They are creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to love them. We have to respect them. We should not hurt them, irrespective whether they're big or small, whether they're short or tall. So these songs, besides a child, his vocabulary increasing, he comes closer to the message of peace. I remember when I was a kid in the late 70s and the early 80s, how a child, you know, wants to learn a computer, so we have a toy computer, and you press a button, and my friend, I remember he had a computer, you press a button, and the song comes. Beat it, whatever it was, of Michael Jackson of that time, or Funky Town. Here, there are computers for children. The moment you press button number one, you hear the voice of Imam Sudesh. Alhamdulillah, you Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Aumiddin. Anyway, I'm not a Qari. So here a child, besides getting entertained, he is coming closer to his creator, closer to the message of peace. Today we have in the world various games which are meant to entertain the child. Islam is for entertainment, but the entertainment should be halal. It should be positive, it should not be negative. We have today in the society, we have games like lotto or lottery. It is nothing but gambling, which Islam prohibits in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal lazina amnu, O you who believe, inna mal khamru al maisuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, well anzabu al islamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rish to minamili shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork. First anibullah lukum tuflihun, abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. So we have to substitute these games with Islamic games. There are some games which are just normal. It entertains the child, but does not get him closer to the message of truth. We have games such as snakes and ladders. There's an Islamic version, which has been invented in UK. It is slopes and ladders. Instead of start, it is Bismillah, in the name of God. When you go a few blocks ahead, there's mention that you have been offering salah daily, you go up a ladder. There it is, you are thanking your creator, almighty God. Few blocks ahead, you are disrespectful to your parents, you come down the slope. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not happy with you. Go a few blocks ahead, you are reading the Quran daily, you go up a ladder. You are getting guidance from your creator, almighty God. Go a few blocks ahead, you have told a lie, you come down the slope. So these games, besides the child getting entertained, he is getting the message that he should respect his parents. He should not tell a lie. He should thank Almighty God daily. He should acquire the guidance from the last and final revelation of the Quran. So Islam is for entertainment, but the entertainment should be positive. There are games which I remember during my childhood. The very famous game, the Monopoly, or we have the trade in India, where it teaches a child how to become a businessman, buying and selling of land. Here we have the Islamic version called the Steps to Paradise, which has been got from UK too. Here it teaches the child how to attain Jannah, how to attain Paradise. And instead of 
dollars or rupees, you have sawabs. Notes, 5,000 sawab, 10,000 sawab, 20,000 sawab. There you come on a slot. It says that you have offered salah daily. You get a reward of 20,000 sawab. You go a few blocks ahead, you went to a dance party. You have to pay a fine of 10,000 sawab. Go a few blocks ahead, you have told a lie. You have to pay a fine of 5,000 sawab. Every child wants to win the game. So if he goes for dance parties, everyone knows he goes. He stops going so that at least he can win the game. These games, besides entertaining the child, it gets him closer to the Creator, Almighty God. There are jigsaw puzzles of great wonders of the world, Afil, Tawar, Taj, Man, etc. We have jigsaw puzzle of the Harmain, of Makkah, of Medina. We have Legos where a child learns to make a car or an aeroplane. Here we have Legos in which a child can build the various mosques. The different designs of mosque. With the Lego, he builds a mosque. So he comes close to the Hadith that anyone who builds a mosque in this world will get a house in the Jannah. This is a unique event, not only in India, but internationally. Only those people who know the value of the media and presenting Islam, only a Dai can know that, believe me, this is the need of the hour. This is the need of the hour. It is the duty of us Muslims that we have to clarify the misconceptions that is there in the minds of the human beings today. It's our duty that we have to convey the message. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110, Allah says, Kuntum khaira ummatan ukhrijat nas. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of people evolved for mankind. Allah is giving us an honor and calling us a khaira ummah, the best of people. There is no honor without responsibility. The responsibility is mentioned in the same verse. Allah continues and says, Ta'miruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna an munkar. Wa tu'minuna billah. Because we enjoin what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. The reason Allah calls us the khaira ummah, the best of people, is because we are supposed to enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. If we do not enjoy what is good and if we do not forbid what is wrong, we aren't fit to be called as Muslims. We aren't fit to be called as people, those who promote peace and submit the will to Almighty God. We aren't fit to be called as khaira ummah, the best people for humanity. Today, when we present Islam, we have to do it professionally. And a beloved prophet, and Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, they always stressed on quality. We require quality work. The reason today the Muslims are misrepresented on the media is because we do not have the correct presentation on the media. We don't have a single international newspaper of our own which can present the true picture of Islam. Islam and Muslims and its derivatives, these words occur in the Quran no less than 96 times. And the word salam occurs in the Quran no less than 42 times. Islam and Muslims, along with the derivatives, occurs 96 times, and the word salam occurs 42 times. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 54, Allah says, وَإِذَا جَاءَقَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِآيَاتِينَ فَقُلْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ when those who come to you, who believe in our signs, wish them, assalamu alaikum, peace be on you. Allah says, whenever those who come to you, who believe in the signs of Almighty God, you have to wish them, peace be on you. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 86, Allah says, wa iza huyitum, bi tayyatum, fahiyu, bi asana minha, aw rudduha, inna allaha, kana kulli shayin alima which means whenever a courteous greeting is given to you, wish back more courteously or at least the same. For Allah is careful in keeping of accounts. For example, if someone wishes you assalamu alaikum, may peace be on you, you have to wish back more courteously. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. If someone says assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, you have to wish back more courteously. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. 
If someone says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, if you cannot better it, at least say the same. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. For example, if someone says, Assalamu alaikum, and reply back, Wa alaikum assalam. The words are the same, but that's coming from the depths of the heart. Even that is better. So Allah says, wish back more courteously, or at least the same. This is the universal greeting of all the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 36, in the upper room, when he comes to the apostles, he wishes them by saying, Shalom Alaikum. In Hebrew, Shalom Alaikum. In Arabic, Assalamu Alaikum. In English, may peace be on you. And this is the theme of the conference, Salam. Peace. It's the best form of greeting. But unfortunately today, we have in a society, there are different types of greeting. One of the most common greeting is good morning or good evening. Imagine if suppose there's a calamity which takes place, if someone's father dies and you wish him good morning. What is so good about the morning? His father has expired and you tell him good morning. And when you go to school, it's common practice. When the teacher enters the class, all the students say, good morning, sir. And the teacher replies back, good morning to you. Imagine the teacher may have had a fight with his wife. He may be cursing the morning. He may be saying, never such a morning should come again in his life. But yet he's forced to reply, good morning. The best and the most universal greeting is, Assalamu alaikum, or peace be on you, irrespective of whether a person's father expires, irrespective of whether a person has a fight with his wife, irrespective of whether he's raiding cats and dogs, irrespective of whether it's a happy moment or a sad moment. The best greeting you can give is Assalamu alaikum, peace be on you. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 63, that the servants of Allah are those who walk with humility. And when the ignorant approach them, they say, Kalu Salama, peace be on you. Allah repeats the message in Surah Qasas, chapter number 28, verse number 55, that those who give vain talks, just tell them, peace be on you. Assalamu alaikum. Means the person who's intelligent, if person gives vain talk, even if he speaks again in Islam, tell him, Assalamu alaikum, or say, Kalu Salama. Peace be on you. That's it. And if you analyze all the verses quoted by the skeptics attacking Islam, that Islam promotes terrorism, and one of the common verses of the Quran quoted by critics, including Arun Shuri, is Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 5. He says, wherever you find a kafir, into bracket, a non-Muslim, you kill them. The reply to this has been given by me when I came to Chennai last year on the topic jihad and terrorism, I don't reply it again. It's in context in a battlefield when the enemies come to kill you, don't get scared, fight back. The context is there. I've discussed in several of my talks and question and session, but the point to be noted, the next verse immediately, Surah Tawbah chapter number 9, verse number 6, which is never quoted by these skeptics, is that if the enemies want asylum, if they want peace, don't just give it to them. Escort them to a place of security. So all the verses, if you analyze, almost all, which talk about killing the enemies, but natural, this fighting with the Quran speaks is to promote peace. And the common verse quoted of the Quran of Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 60, that cause terror in the hearts of the enemies. Again, quote out of context. It means that in the battlefield, when the enemies come to attack you, when they come to kill you, don't get scared, fight back. Any army general in the battlefield will tell his soldiers, don't get scared, fight back. It's but natural. So what's wrong in Quran saying that? But that's not the end of it. Next verse, Surah Anfar, chapter number 8, verse number 61 says, but if the enemies want peace, if they incline for peace, you too incline for peace. Islam is a religion of peace. All these verses quoted in the Quran, wherever it talks about fighting as the last resort, it is fighting for peace to be established. Every country has a police force. This police force many a time uses force 
so that the criminals can be arrested. They use force against the anti-social element so that peace can prevail, so that we people, citizens of the country, can walk freely. So these police sometimes use this force so that peace will prevail in the country. Similarly, Islam and Quran talks that force can be used as the last resort only to let peace prevail if this is why the skeptics say that Quran promotes terrorism, they fail to realize that such terrorism is even promoted by the Bible in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, in the book of Numbers. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he too promoted this terrorism. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 22, he too told the apostles, take a sword, go and fight. Mahabharat talks about the same terrorism. It's the fight between the haq and the batil, truth and falsehood. Bhagavad Gita, Shri Krishna, he gives advice to Arjun that why are you not fighting? Have you become important? Shri Krishna tells Arjun, if you don't fight, you shall not get paradise. This is a terrorism to promote peace, which is mentioned in almost all the major scriptures of the world. There are two types of terrorism. One is a positive terrorism to promote peace in the world. The other is terrorizing the innocent people, which we Muslims should never indulge. And Dr. Adam Pearson said that people who worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs, they fail to realize that the Islamic bomb has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. Islam, this religion, has the solution to the problems of humankind. And this last and final revelation of Almighty God has the solutions to the problems of mankind. Number one is that all the human beings should agree that our creator is only one God. Only if we agree that the creator of all the people, irrespective of whether they live in America, in Canada, in UK, in India, in Saudi Arabia, our creator is the same one almighty God. This is the basic pillar for peace. Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number 32, that if anyone kills any human being, unless it be for murder or spreading mischief in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if anyone saves any human being, it's as though he has saved the whole of humanity. Quran says, anyone, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, kills any other human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for murder or for spreading mischief in the land, for spreading corruption, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if anyone saves any human being, whether it be a Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though he has saved the whole of humanity. Allah says in the Quran that you should give charity. Every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, 85 grams of gold, you should give 2.5% of that saving every lunar year in charity. It is called as zakat. If every rich human being gives zakat, poverty will be eradicated. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. Quran says do not rob. Quran says that love your neighbors, feed your neighbors. Our beloved prophet said that he is not a Muslim who sleeps with a full stomach while his neighbor, he is hungry. And the person asked, who is a neighbor? The prophet said, 40 houses next to you is a neighbor. Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 188, that do not use your wealth as a bait for the judges, so that you may eat other people's wealth. Bribing is prohibited in Quran. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 26 and 27, that do not be a spendthrift. Do not do a sraf. For verily, a person who is a spendthrift is the brother of the devil. Allah says in the Quran, which was recited by the Qari, in Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 11 and 12, that do not backbite. Do not call each other with offensive nicknames. Do not spy on one another. Do not be suspicious, because many a time, suspicion is a sin. 
And further it continues, Bakari recited, Surah Hujurah chapter 49 verse number 13, where Allah says, Ya yuwan nasu, inna khalaqnaakum min zakrin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum, shu'uba wa qaba ila alitaarafu. Inna karamkum in the law yatkaakum, inna law alimun kabeer, which means, O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female, and have divided you into nations and tribes, so that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Almighty God is the person who has taqwa. The criteria for judgment in the sight of Almighty God, it's not wealth, it's not sex, it's not color, it's not caste, but it is taqwa, it is God consciousness, it is righteousness, it is piety. The only way that all the human beings can come under one banner is that we have one common parents. And our creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, almighty God, is one and the same. Islam is a religion of peace, peace to humanity. It does not only talk about peace, it demonstrates practically how peace and universal brotherhood can be achieved. And one of the pillars of Islam is Salah. I say Salah is the programming towards righteousness. It's the best way how a doctor tells you that for a healthy body, you require minimum three meals. Similarly, for a peaceful soul, you require minimum five times prayer. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Adhan, chapter number 75, hadith number 692, the Prophet said, before starting Salah, that straight in your rows, stand shoulder to shoulder and ankle to ankle. It's mentioned in the Hadith book of Sunnah Abu Dawood, volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 245, Hadith number 666, a beloved part from Muhammad Sallallahu before offering Salah, he turned around and said, that straight in your rows, stand shoulder to shoulder and ankle to ankle and do not leave any gaps for the Satan. Close in your gaps so that the Satan doesn't come in. Here the Prophet, he was talking about the Satan of caste, of color, of creed. That when we stand for Salah, we stand shoulder to shoulder, irrespective whether rich or poor, black or white, yellow or brown, king or papa. When you stand for Salah, when you stand for prayers, we stand shoulder to shoulder. We practically demonstrate minimum five times a day universal brotherhood and how peace can be obtained. And the best example of international universal brotherhood and peace is the fifth pillar of Islam, that is Hajj. It's compulsory that every adult Muslim who has the means to perform Hajj should at least perform the pilgrimage to the holy city of Makkah in the month of Hajj at least once in his lifetime. People from different parts of the world, from America, from UK, from Singapore, from Malaysia, from India, from Pakistan, different parts of the world, the men, they're dressed up in two pieces of unsewn cloth, preferably white. You cannot identify the person standing next to you, whether it's king or a pauper, whether it's rich or poor. Practical demonstration of universal brotherhood. And this message of peace is not only meant for the Muslims or for the Arabs. Allah says that this Quran is the last and final revelation of Almighty God. And because it was the last and final revelation, it was not only sent for the Muslims or the Arabs, Allah says in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number one, Alif, Lam, Ra. This is a message given to thee, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, so that you may lead the humankind from darkness to light, not only the Muslims or the Arabs, but the whole of humankind from darkness to light. Peace, a vision of Islam, is not meant only for the Muslims or the Arabs, it is meant for the whole of humanity. And for ultimate peace, I'd like to end my talk by the formula given in the Quran for ultimate peace in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number one to three, which says, Wal Asr, inna insana lafi khusr, illa lazin amanu, wa amil salihati, wa tawasaw bil haqqi, wa tawasaw bil sabr. That by the token of time, man is well in a state of loss. Almighty God says, man is in khasara, is in loss, except those who have these four criteria. Only those who have these four criteria will enter Jannah, will go to paradise. Allah says, first is Iman, faith. Next 
is amal salihat, that is righteous deed. Third is inviting people to truth, that is doing dawa, calling people towards the truth. And fourth is inviting people to patience and perseverance. I started my talk by quoting a verse of the Quran from Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 21, which says, وَقُلْ جَعَ الْحَقُّ وَزَاقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوكَ When truth is heard like in falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. I would like to end my talk with the quotation of the glorious Quran of Sulay Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, which says, إِنَّ الدِّينَ إِنَّ the اللَّهِ islam The only religion acceptable in the sight of Almighty God is the religion of peace by submitting your will to Almighty God. Wakhru Dawan Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Jazakallah Khair. Now we go on to the next part of the agenda, which is a question and answer session. Yes, sister. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. My question is to Dr. Zakir Naik. Uh, in the beginning of your talk, you said about the criteria of hijab. The very first point is clothing must cover the entire body. And it doesn't consist of the face and the hand, the levis should, uh, can or cannot be covered. Please clarify. Sister so asked a question that when I mentioned the criteria for hijab, and I always do in my talk the six criteria, and I mentioned that the first criteria is for the woman, the complete body should be covered except the face and the hands up to the wrist. Many scholars say this should be covered, that's what I say in my talk. Now the question she's asking me that which is right, should the entire body be covered? or the face and hands can be seen. This is a question which has troubled many scholars and sages. And we as Muslim sister should follow Quran and the Sunnah. There is not a single verse in the complete Quran, nor is there a single hadith, a sahih hadith, in any of the hadith of the Prophet which says that the face should be covered. I am aware that there are many scholars written books that face should be covered, the many scholars have written that the face can be open. So in the criteria of the extent for the woman, according to my study, the complete body should be covered except the face and the hands up to the wrist. And this has even been told by Sheikh Nasruddin al-Bani. Even he writes in his book of Fatwa and gives various Sahih Hadith, which shows that at the time of the Prophet, there were lady companions of the Prophet Sahabiyas who had the face uncovered the several Hadith. For example, Hazrat Bilal, may Allah be pleased with him, when there was a collection and there was a lady who took out jewelry and it was said that she was a black lady. But then in the hadith when the companion said that if you want to see a woman who has been promised paradise, look at that woman. How could you recognize the woman unless he had seen her face? And if you see my answer I've given in the Islamic voice, there are various Sahih hadith which show that at the time of the Prophet there were lady companions who did show their faces. And this is also mentioned by Sheikh Nasir al-Bani, but I'm also aware that the other great scholars like Sheikh bin Baz and Sheikh Utaymi, who say that the face should be covered. But any authentic scholars, any Salaf scholars, what they say that any lady who covers the face should not rebuke at those ladies who don't cover their face. And those who do not cover the face should not rebuke at those who cover their face. So the scholars are divided, but there's not a single authentic hadith according to Sheikh Nasruddin al-Bani who says that the face should be covered. There are various hadith in Abu Dawud also, when the sister of Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, Hazrat Asma, may Allah be pleased with her, when she comes in from the Prophet, the Prophet says, now we have reached maturity. Your complete body should be covered except the face and the hands up to the wrist. This is a Mursal hadith. But according to Sheikh Nasr al Mani, he supports it with Sahih hadith and says, this hadith which is Mursal becomes a Sahih. So he gives various Sahih hadith which say that if a woman wants to expose the face, she can. So covering the face is not a fard. It is mustahab. If someone covers the face, a woman, alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah. It is good. I will never object to it. But what Allah and his prophet has not made the fard, no woman, no scholar in the world, let it be anyone, can make it fard on any other muslimah. So based on research, and even we have various research that we do in IRF, and many, I know it is common that the woman should cover the face. But when I ask any scholar, present to me any Sai Hadith, any one single Sai Hadith, in which it says that the Prophet commanded that you should cover your face, you will not find a single. And there's neither any verse in the Quran which says that the face should be covered. All the verses of Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31, and Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse number 59, it talks about Jilbab 
talks about the woman's body should be covered. It never talks about the face being covered. Even Surah Nur chapter 24, verse number 31 says that the veil should go over the bosoms. But yet, I also say that covering the face is mustahab. It's encouraged. It is not a fard. So what the Prophet and Allah has not made fard, even I cannot make. So covering the face for a woman in Islam is not fard according to me. Yet there are many scholars who say it should be covered. I say, fine, it is their view. Since no one has presented me any Sahih Hadith, any verse of the Quran. So based on that, sister, all those ladies are covering the face. Alhamdulillah, please continue. Please don't misunderstand. And I know that there were at least about 17 ladies from IRF who came, out of which 14 were covering the face. Alhamdulillah. Three weren't. So the option is yours. It's not a farz. But if those who are covering, it is good. Keep on covering. I'm not saying you should not cover. But since covering is not farz, you cannot enforce on any woman to cover the face. Hope that answers the question. Brothers, please ask your questions. Is it right to call Allah as God because God is the masculine gender and Goddess is the feminine gender? That is the question that when we translate Allah as God in English, is it right? God is a masculine gender, God is a feminine, is it right? I do agree with you, brother, that God is not the appropriate translation of the Arabic word Allah. Therefore, we Muslims prefer calling Allah by the word Allah instead of God, because I do agree that a person can play mischief with the English word God. If you add S to God, it becomes God's, meaning a plural of God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got no plural. Qul ho Allah ahad. Say is Allah one and only. If you add D-E-S-S to God, it becomes goddess. That means there's a male God and a female God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got no gender. He's neither feminine, he's neither masculine. He's unique. If you add father to God, it becomes Godfather. He is my Godfather. There is nothing like Allah Abba or Allah Father in Islam. If you add mother to God, it becomes Godmother. There is nothing like Allah Ammi or Allah Mother in Islam. Allah is a unique word. Therefore, we prefer calling Allah with the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God. But when certain Muslims, when they are speaking with non-Muslims who may not understand the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if they use the word God for Allah, like how I have done, because many people out here are non-Muslim, they may not understand the concept of Allah. So if we translate Allah as God for the convenience of those who don't know the true concept of Allah, there's no problem. But God, I do agree with you, is not the correct translation of the Arabic word Allah. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. The brother is asking about the date line. There is a time difference in the date line. And he wants to know that if he is on one side of the date line and he has prayed Juma and he has crossed over to the other side, and if it is Juma work there, it could be the same day. So, what he has to do? So, he's got a non Muslim brother who's asking this question. Assalamu alaikum. And he wants Dr. Zakir Naik to answer that. Well, that was a question that if a person is traveling, and we know that there's a date line. The date line is such that it doesn't go through any country. It goes in the sea. So if a person has prayed Jummah Salah, then he crosses the date line, and he goes on the other side. And then again, Jummah is there. So what should he do? If a situation arises where, suppose, for example, if you have celebrated Eid, so you have to celebrate Eid with the people where you're staying with. So you've already celebrated Eid and offered the Eid Salah. Again, when you come to a place, because you started Ramadan with those people, ended there. Now you come to a new country. For example, in Saudi Arabia, you started Ramadan, celebrate Ramadan, celebrate Eid, etc. And then come again to India, where the Eid is approximately one or two days later, you need not again offer the Eid Salah. So if you have offered a Jummah Salah, and you cross the date line, and again Jummah comes, so there you need not offer your Jummah Salah. But the chances of this is very less, because the time taken to travel, it's quite a lot. You have to go from this part of the world to that part of the world. But if it happens, if you have offered a Juma Salah, you need not offer your Juma Salah again, because that week Juma is already over. And if you offer also at that time, it doesn't become a farad, like you can offer your Zuhar Salah. So if you join the Juma also, there's no problem. Point to be noted, for a traveler, Juma is not farad. For a traveler, Juma is not farad. So if you're traveling, Juma doesn't become fard on you. Even if you miss it, if you're in the plane or if you're traveling, it's not fard on you. So if you pray, Alhamdulillah, if you want to pray Juma again also, no problem. You can even pray the first Salah again. 
Like if I have offered my Maghrib Salah, and again there's a Jamaat, there's a Hadith in which a person did not join the Jamaat. So Prophet said, that, are you a Muslim? He said, yes. Why didn't you join the Salah? So he said, I've already offered. So why can't you offer again? So when you can offer your first Salah again, you can even offer Juma Salah again. There's no problem at all. But Juma is not far on a traveler. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, there's a sister here who wants to know the method of uh, Salah. Is it the same for the man and the woman? Same for the Shafi and the Hanafi? This is the question that is the method of offering Salah for the man and woman the same for the Shafi or Hanafi the same? Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one. The Prophet said, pray as you see me pray. The Prophet did not say that the women should pray separately or the men should pray separately. There's a hadith. Again, in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one in the book of Salah, that the Sahabiyas, they prayed the same way as the men prayed. There's no different type of praying for men and women. You should pray the same as the Prophet prayed, irrespective of whether you are a man or a woman. I am aware that there are books available in the market, in India and throughout the world, of different schools of thought, that the style of praying for women is different because they are seen and the men is different. There is no such Sahih Hadith. For the reply in Islam, always, your answer should be backed up with Quran and Sahih Hadith. Always, Quran and Sahih Hadith. So whenever you give a reference, any scholar, let it be the biggest scholar in the world. If he gives the answer, there should be proof, quotation from the Quran and Hadith. Ask him for proof. There is not a single Sahih Hadith. There is no verse in the Quran which says that the styles for offering Salah is different for the men and women. I am aware that scholars of their own view, they said, okay, fine, because women should be protected, they should pray differently. These are their thinking. But the Prophet never said that. We should pray as the Prophet prayed. Regarding the style for offering Salah as the Hanafi style and the Shafi style, I am aware that it does differ. The Hanafi, they keep their hand below the navel. The Shafi keep their hand on the chest. They do takbir. They say amin loudly. Again, my first answer. Quran Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet said, in volume number one in the book of Salah, pray as you see me pray. And all the four ayamahs, Imam Shafi, Imam Ayat ibn Hanbal, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, all the great four ayamahs said that if you find any of my fatwa which goes against Allah and his Rasul, throw my fatwa on the wall. I am aware Abu Hanifa, may Allah be pleased with him. He was a great scholar. I respect him. I love him. People say that he said that when you offer salah, keep your hand below the navel. There's a hadith in Abu Dawood. If you read volume number one, book of salah, which says that the prophet kept his hand below his navel when he offered salah. But this is a zaif hadith. Immediately the next hadith says, which is a sahih hadith, that the prophet kept his hand above the navel. There are other sahih hadith in Sahih ibn Khazayma, which says that the prophet kept his hand on the chest. So when there are Sahih Hadith saying the Prophet kept on the chest, the Hadith below the navel is Zaif. So the right way to offer Salah, keep it on the chest. That doesn't mean everything Imam Shafi is right or Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah be pleased with them both, that they're wrong. See, they were great scholars. We respect them, they're great ayamas. But we fail to realize that at that time, the Hadith one compiled during the life of the Prophet, the Quran was compiled. There was no question at all, under his own supervision. But the hadith one compiled, they start being compiled later on, 50 years, 100 years, 150 years later on. So these scholars came earlier. And because they didn't have all the Sahih hadith with them, the fatwas that they gave were based on the knowledge that they had. I don't think that Abu Hanifa, may Allah be pleased, made a mistake. What he did, because that Sahih hadith didn't reach him. So maybe according to me, the Zaif hadith reached him, and he may have said, keep your hand below the navel. The Sahih hadith may have reached Imam Shafi, he said, that keep your hands on the chest. Again, Sai Bukhari says, volume number one in the book of Salah, that you have to rafatain. So rafatain, the Prophet said, not because Imam Shafi is saying I'm following it, because my Prophet said it. Now in Wudu, there's a verse in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number five, that it says that when the woman touches, the Wudu breaks. The Arabic word is Masa, coming from Namasa, which means touch. According to Imam Shafi, may Allah be pleased with him, he says, that if the woman touches, the wudu breaks. Imam Abu Hanifa said, if the woman touches a man who's in wudu, wudu does not break. Now the Arabic verse of the Quran says, La masa, if the woman touches, wudu breaks. But there are two meanings of masa. One is a sexual touch, and the other is a physical touch. So Imam Shafi, may Allah be peace with him, he took it as a physical touch. Imam Abu Hanifa, he took it as a sexual touch. 
So both had a difference of opinion. But when you go to Sunnah Abu Dawood, volume number one, in the hadith of Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. The Prophet was in wudu, he kissed her. And the Prophet, without doing wudu again, went for salah. There's another hadith in Sahih Bukhari, in the book of Salah, volume number one. The Hazrat Aisha was sleeping, the Prophet put the leg and offered salah. So this proves that physical tie does not break the wudu. So here, Abu Hanifa, may Allah be pleased with him, is right. And Imam Shafi, not that he made a mistake willfully, that hadith didn't reach him. So all were great scholars, and all the Imma said, that if you find any of my fatwa, which goes against Allah and his Rasul, then throw my fatwa on the wall. So I say that I am a pakka Hanafi. I, Dr. Zakir Naik is a pakka Hanafi. Why? Abu Hanifa maybe gave the fatwa, keep down below the navel while offering salah. But the Sai Hadith says keep on the chest. So I, while offering salah, I keep off my chest. I am a pakka Hanafi. Imam Shafi said, if you find any of my fatwa, which goes against Allah and the soul, throw my fatwa on the wall. So Imam Shafi said that if the woman touches the man in wudu, wudu breaks. But Sai Hadith says wudu does not break. So my wudu does not break if a woman unintentionally touches me. So because I've thrown the fatwa of Imam Shafi on the wall, he said that I'm a pakka Shafi. I'm a pakka Hanafi, I'm a pakka Shafi, I'm pakka Hamli, I'm also pakka Maliki. Pakka means strange. I follow 100%, other people follow 80%, 90%. Or 60% of Abu Hanifa. I follow total. All the great four Aima said, if you find any of my fatwa, which goes against Allah and the Rasul, throw my fatwa on the wall. All these scholars, the great scholars, we have to respect them. But we have to realize that the hadith won't compile. Today, everything on the fingertips, on the CD-ROM, in the books available. So now the scholars are there, and out of lack of information, for example, there's my brother, who's a doctor, and Copernicus. Copernicus was a great scientist. But my brother has more knowledge than Copernicus on science, even more than Einstein. But Einstein was more brilliant. Because today, science has advanced. That doesn't mean my brother is more genius than, than Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein is a much bigger genius than my brother. But now, brother, because hundreds of years have passed, he has more information about science. So information he has more. But a bigger genius is Albert Einstein, Isaac Newton, is Copernicus. But today, because science has advanced, we have the information with us. So those scholars were great genius. We love them, we respect them, but today the information has been compiled, so we have to realize, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number three, verse number 103, wa tafarku. Hold the rope of Allah strong and be not divided. We should not divide ourselves into all sects. So the only way of offering salah is not Hanafi style or Shafi style or Maliki style, it is the style of the Prophet. And Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah please with him. Imam Shafi, may Allah please with him. They told, if you find anything of my fatwa which goes against Allah and Rasul, throw my fatwa on the wall. So if you're a pakka Hanafi, you have to offer as the Sai Hadith says. If you're a pakka Shafi, offer as what the Sai Hadith says. Then you'll be following the true Islam. Hope that answers the question, sister. Brothers, please ask your questions relevant to the topic. Sir, my name is Kumar Swami Hariharan. My question is to... Zahir Naik, sir. One of my friends purchased the Quran and came to my room. I was so interested and uh, just I went to have a look of it. Immediately, he told me that this is the holy book since it has been written by the God directly, you should not touch till the date. Whenever I am moving to his house, till now I am not touching it. Is it the right or wrong? I don't know. Since he is following correctly, and one more question, sir. And uh, another friend, this time, he is moving to his house for celebrating the Ramjan. He told, hello, Hariharan, I am moving. So, by hearty love, I went to hug him. Then immediately he told, no, no, you should not hug. Then I asked him, whether today is the day we should not hug. I don't know about it. That's why I asked. Today is the day we should not hug. Then he told, no, we should not hug at all to a Muslim. This is the another friend I asked. Then he told, no, it's wrong answer. You, you, know, you can hug. 
when, from that time whenever i am hugging i feel myself guilty and uh, shy i am doing the wrong thing please clarify my doubts sir the brother has asked two very important questions two great misconceptions the first question of his was that one of his friends said when he went to touch the quran no you cannot touch the quran this is the word of almighty god is it true that non muslims can't touch the quran there is a misconception as this conference is not only for the non muslims as i said it's even for the muslims there is a misconception amongst the muslims that a non muslims cannot touch the quran and this misconception is based on one verse of the quran of surah waqia chapter number 56 verse number 77 to 80 which says that this quran has been revealed by allah subhanahu wa taala and none shall touch except those who are pure now based on this verse of the quran may non muslims they assume that the muslims are pure non muslims are impure they cannot touch it this you should know the nuzul quran when was this verse revealed this verse of the quran was revealed when many non muslims objected and said that prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam knows billah he gets this revelation from the satans so then this verse was revealed that none shall touch except those of pure talking about the quran of lohim hafuz if you read tafsir ibn qasir it gives the clarification that this is talking about lohim hafuz the quran which is there in the seventh heaven none shall touch except the angels the arabic word there mutahharin mentioned refers to the angels not only pure in body but those who are sinless so that quran which is in lohim hafuz none shall touch except the angels so if a satan wants to pick up these parts of the quran he cannot come close to it it doesn't refer to mere tahara which we talk about wudu if this verse really means none shall touch except those in wudu any non muslim can purchase a quran for 150 rupees and touch it and the quran will be proved wrong so this verse doesn't talk about the wudu it talks about the lohim hafuz which none shall touch no human being can also touch except the angels and i always encourage that the best book you can give the best message is the message of allah subhanahu wa taala my speech is useless what human being can explain better than allah subhanahu wa taala creator we have to share the message of the quran and there are some people who say brother zakir okay fine give only the translation not the arabic i said fine okay that also you want to give give at least but i prefer giving along with the arabic why because in the translation they can make a mistake if the mistake is that it can be attributed to allah subhanahu wa taala wrongly and falsely for example some of the urdu translation say of surah luqman chapter 31 verse 34 that no one besides allah knows what is the sex of the child in the mother's womb if a non muslim who has medical knowledge today with ultrasonography we can easily come to know what is the sex of the child i being a doctor i know that the translation is wrong no way does allah use the word sex what allah says no one will know what is in the womb of the mother talking about the nature of the child whether the child will be good or bad whether it will be bane for society or boon for society whether they go to jannah or jahannam hell or paradise no one knows all the scientists with the best equipment they cannot predict this so the translation is a mistake so if we give the arabic text anyone who knows arabic can testify that the translator has made a mistake not allah subhanahu wa taala i personally prefer giving along with the arabic text and if if allah subhanahu wa taala holds me responsible i'll be in good company you know why because the beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he when he gave the message to the non muslim kings he dictated ayahs of the quran to the sahabas and one of such of the letters is already present in koptaki museum in turkey and there muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he had dictated the verse of the quran of al imran chapter number 3 verse number 64 which says kul ya ahl al kitab say o people of the book ta'alu ila kalmatin sawa'in bayna baynakum come to common terms as in us and you which is the first term allah na uda illa allah that we worship none but allah wala nushrika bihi shay'an that we associate to partners with him wala yattakhiza ba'duna ba'dan arbaban min dunil la that we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than allah fa'in tawallaw if then they turn back fa kullu shadu say be witness be anna muslimun that we are muslim is bowing over to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam dictated letters containing verse of the quran which were given to non muslims many non muslims you know some of them accepted islam alhamdulillah some tore the letter some even trampled it beneath their feet prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave verses of the quran to a non muslim he trampled it beneath his feet so brother there's no problem at all you being a non muslim you can read the quran we muslims we sit like cobras on the quran it is not our property 
it is everyone's property. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. You can very well read the translation. Thank you. Read the translation. If you think something is worth accepting, accept it. If you have any queries, you can ask the person who has knowledge on the Quran. You can touch it. There's no problem at all. If anyone says that, why can't Muslim touch? You ask him for proof. There's no verse in the Quran or no hadith which says that you cannot touch. Now coming to your second question, that can a non-Muslim embrace a Muslim? Or can a Muslim embrace a non-Muslim? Brother, Alhamdulillah, there's no problem at all. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he embraced many non-Muslims. Our Sabahs, irrespective of they're black or white, rich or poor, yellow or brown, king or pauper, there's no problem, Alhamdulillah. This is good. It shows universal brotherhood. There's no problem at all, brother, embracing. You can very well embrace a Muslim, can embrace a non-Muslim. A non-Muslim can embrace a Muslim. There's no verse in the Quran Hadith which says that Muslim and non-Muslim can't embrace. This is a misconception. Your Muslim friend, he does not have proper knowledge of Islam. That's why he might have told you out of ignorance. But in Islam, you can very well embrace. There's no problem. Thank you very much, sir. Brother Hariharan, please come to the stage. Dr. Zakir Nayak will present him a translation of the Quran. Here yeah, we can say that Zakir Naik himself has given me a translation of the Quran. We are running out of time. I think we will take one more question and uh, inshallah we will conclude. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Shakil Ahmad. I won a gold of say 100 grams this year and I pay zakat this year. I carry forward that gold of 100 grams to next year. Do I have to pay a zakat next year also for this gold in addition to whatever wealth I earn the next year? The brother asked this question, and this question can only arise in Madras and Chennai, no wells. <laughs> I'm aware that there is the controversy. Some person who has said that zakat if paid once in the year, you don't have to pay again in the next year. There is no such hadith of beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There are various such hadith which say that zakat has to be paid 2.5% above the nisab level, 85 grams of gold. And there are various hadith, Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. He said, all those who have not paid zakat, I will see to it that they pay. Those who have already paid last year. There are various such hadith which mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. He said, those who do not pay zakat again, again means they have already paid before. And I know this controversy arised when Dr. Bilal Phillips also was here in a trip to Chennai. I'm aware that he wrote a book giving proof that zakat should be paid every year. If you lose that gold, if you don't own it, then you have to pay. If you own it every lunar year, it is every lunar year. So if you own it for one year minimum, you have to pay. If you have that same gold with you for next year, again you have to pay every year, you have to pay 2.5% of whatever savings you have above the Nisab level. Hope that answers the question. One more question from the sisters. Sisters, please. Uh, there are sisters waiting. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. I would like to ask you if a woman has such a pivotal role in Islam, why is that she's prevented from interacting with men? And today is an extremely competitive world. I mean, how without interacting with men, writing for competitive exams and appearing for such, you can stop yourself from growing? The sister asked the question, today is a world of competition. Without women interacting, how can they compete in this world, etc.? Sister, Islam is a religion which has uplifted the woman and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the major benefactor. There's not a single rule in Islam which prevents the upliftment of the woman. But in the name of upliftment, Islam does not believe in degrading women. If you see history, sister, history of Babylon, history of Greek, history of Egypt civilization, women were only used for sex and pleasure. And today if you see the Western world, the Western society, talking of uplifting the woman, have actually degraded her to a status of mistresses, of concubine, of society butterflies, which are mere tools in the hands of pleasure seekers and sex marketers. Today, the Western society, talking about women's liberalization, it is nothing but a disguised form of exploitation of a body, of degradation of an honor, and deprivation of a soul. Sister, Islam never, never wants to prevent the women from upliftment. But I don't know of a single job or a single competition in which a woman does not interact with men and she cannot advance. All the jobs 
which involves unnecessary interaction of the men and jobs which are fit for the women to be done. There's not a single modest job which I know which prevents the woman about the modesty role. If there's a job, any job, which prevents you from doing the hijab, hijab not only of the body, not only of the clothes, the way you talk, the way you behave, the way you think, all this comes under hijab. This hijab which I spoke earlier about the hijab that the sister asked me, that's one part of hijab that is the clothes. There are hadith in which the wives of the Prophet, they did cover their face. But everything what the Prophet did is not first fast. Similarly, for the wives of the Prophet, because the Ummul Mu'mineen, they were mother of the believers. For them was a different degree. So they did cover their face, but it's not for all the women. So here if we analyze, sister, the hijab, besides hijab of the clothes, the hijab way a person talks, the way a person behaves. And these people, when they talk about equality, when the Western world talks about equality, I ask them, that when men and women are equal, so why don't you have a boxing match between the men and women together? Why? They're equal. Even they agree that they're not equal. When we have a 100 meter sprint, why do the women run differently? Why do the men run differently? Why? Are they degrading the women? Yes or no? So you realize that these people, they have their own way of thinking. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the man and woman different. Physiologically they're different, biologically they're different, psychologically they're different. Depending upon their roles, what they have been given, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the do's and don'ts for these people. Not that a man and woman cannot interact. Unnecessary interaction is to be avoided. And believe me, sister, a woman can take part. We have examples, and if you hear my talk on women rights in Islam, sister, there are various examples. Now, in the Western world, when they sit for examination, men and women sit together. So there they consider them equal. But when they run a 100 meters dash or have a boxing match, they don't consider them equal. When the Western world can differentiate, that here they can take part together, here they cannot take part. Why can't our creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows the best? So unnecessary interaction, sister, I call it the khutwatu shaitan. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 168, Allah says, Ya ayu lazina amunu, O you believe, do not follow the footsteps of the devil. See, most of the places Allah says, do not follow the footsteps of the devil, do not follow the devil is right. That's only a couple of times. Majority time Allah says, do not follow the footsteps of the devil. And I give an example, sister. One example of footsteps of the devil is that suppose there is an average Muslim. If a lady comes to him and says, let's spend the night together. He says, spend the night, haram, not allowed. He will say no. The same Muslim, who's an average Muslim, if a lady phones, speaking to a girl on the phone, what's the problem? So he speaks to the girl on the phone. After a few calls, he said, let's have maybe tea in McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken, I don't know if they're in Madras or not, or let's go to fast food joint. Going with a girl to fast food joint, no problem. After some time, she says, let's have dinner in a restaurant. Dinner with a girl restaurant, no problem. Then she said, let's spend the night together. Spend the night together, no problem. These are khutbah to shaitan. It's not mentioned in the Quran. I'm giving my own example. Khutbah to shaitan. So therefore, stop it at the first level itself. When it's a requirement, when you have to speak to the man when requirement in emergency, etc., yes, you can do with lowering your gaze. Suppose you're a lady and you get sick and there's a gen doctor, very well, you can go to the gen doctor. That doesn't mean you cannot speak to the gen doctor. When required, but with lowering your gaze, with modesty, but unnecessary gossiping what they have in colleges. In colleges, they gossip very common, not only in the Western world. In Western world, according to the statistics of USA, more than 90% of the women before they pass school, they have lost their virginity. Do you know that? Same in UK. Even in Bombay, I was shocked. More than 50% of the girls, before they pass their school, they lose their virginity. I was shocked. Why? Common having girlfriend, boyfriend, you go, you know, it's common. If you don't have a girlfriend, then you're considered to be abnormal. So the thing is, sister, these are khutwa to shaitan, and we want to uplift the women. And these people in the name of trying to uplift the women, art and culture, no problem. They want to sell their daughters and their mothers on the screen. And someone told me, one of the ads which won an award, the BMW ad, somebody told me. The BMW ad, it's a car which is very famous. For the youngsters, like how Mercedes, you know Merck, it's a very famous car. For the youngsters, it's a BMW. There's a very famous ad, someone told me. There's a girl standing on a bikini in front of the car. And it says, test driver now. Who, the girl or the car? 
What are they doing? They're selling our daughters. They are selling their sisters. We Muslims, we don't want that. In the name of upliftment, we don't want to sell our daughters, don't want to sell our sisters. We respect them, we love them, and we revere them. This is the reason, sister, this does not degrade the woman. It uplifts the woman. Hope that answers the question. My name is Abdul Kuddus. I got one small question. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in many hadiths, he has said there is a punishment in the khabars for the dead bodies, punishment in the khabar. But how about people who are not buried in the khabar? What type of punishment they get and how do they get it? Where do they get it? Assalamu alaikum. So that was the question that the hadith is there of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that in the khabar, there is azab is there, the word the punishment is there. It is known as barzakh. Barzakh means the interim life. After a person dies, and before it's resurrected, it's a barzakh, an interim life. So if those who are not buried, what about them? See, when the Prophet said in the Qabr, means after a person dies and before he's resurrected. If a person drowns and dies there, yet he's dead. If a person is burnt alive in a fire, or there are various other religions who burn, even in this case, before the person is resurrected, after he's dead, before he's resurrected, if Allah wants to give him punishment, he'll get the punishment. If Allah wants to reward, he will reward him. That doesn't mean that he has to be physically present underground that this thing can take place. That will yet take place. And final recompense will be on the day of judgment. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 85, Allah says, Kullu nafsin maut. Every soul shall have a taste of death. But the final recompense will be on the day of judgment. So when you lead this life, this life is a test for the hereafter, according to Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2. But... You may get part punishment here, you may not get. You may get part reward here, you may not get. Part maybe in the birth of, but the final hisab kitab, the final judgment will be when you are resurrected. And that will be the true judgment and he is Malik Yomadeen, he is the master of the day of judgment. Hope that answers the question. Brother, please. Please identify yourself. I am an SK from Bangalore, Karnataka. I pray peace. I love Muslims and the preachers. But in country like India, multi-religious country, we all live together and go for a peace and for the brotherhood. But according to the current, current conditions, what is your message for brotherhood? It is my request to Dr. Jackie. Can you uh, introduce yourself, please? Your name, please, brother. I am NSK from Bangalore, Karnataka, social worker. Actually, he is MLA from Karnataka. Brother, we love you too. We love you too. Well, there's a question that in this place of turmoil, it said, what's my message about brotherhood? And I did say in my talk, brother, I did give a few points that Islam means peace to humanity. It is a religion of universal brotherhood. That we believe that all human beings are brothers. In Islam, all human beings are brothers. Irrespective of whether black or white, rich or poor, whether born in a Hindu family or Christian family, we are brothers in humanity. And Muslims are brothers in faith. But all the human beings are brothers. And for this brotherhood, as I mentioned in my talk, brother, the only way, the best formula that all human beings can come together under one umbrella is to realize that our Creator, our Lord, our Almighty God is one. And this is the message not only given in the Quran, it is given in all the major scriptures of the world. If you read the Hindu scriptures, it's mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 7, verse number 20. It says, all those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship demigods. It's mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. It says, Ekam Evidityam. It's a Sanskrit quotation which means, God is only one without a second. It's mentioned in the Shrita Shutara Upanishad, chapter number 6, verse number 9. It says, Na cha se chasij janita na kadipa. Of him, there are no parents. He has got no Lord, Almighty God has got no mother. He has got no father. He has got no superior. It's clearly mentioned in the Ejurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, Na asti. Of him, there is no likeness. He has got no images. 
and the Brahma Sutra of Hinduism is Ekam Brahm Dustya Naste, Niya Naste Kinchan. Bhagwan Eki hai, Dusra Nahi hai. Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Zara bhi Nahi hai. There is only one God, not a second, not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. This is the same message given in the Quran, in Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Qul hu Allah ahad. Say he is Allah and only. Allah hu samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Lam yulid, walam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. Walam yakullah kufman ahad. There is nothing like him. Brother, this is also mentioned in Christianity. I can give quotations from the Bible. I can give quotations from the six scriptures. All the scriptures say God is one. God has got no images, he alone should be worshipped, he has got no sons, he has got no mother, he has got no father. So if all the human beings realize that our God, our creator is one, then only can we have the true brotherhood. Besides this, there is no other formula. And as I mentioned in my talk, and which the Qari recited at the beginning of the talk, Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 13, which says, Ya ayyuhan nasu, inna khalaqnaakum min zakrin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum shu'uba wa qaba'ila litarafu. Which means, O oh humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa. The criteria for judgment is not sex, it's not color, it's not caste, it's not wealth, but it is God consciousness, it is piety, it is righteousness. So we have to realize that we have got one common grandparents and we are a big brotherhood. So the best thing is we should read other people's scriptures and come to common terms and based on the verse of the Quran of Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, which says, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa in banana Come to common terms as us and you, which is the first term, Allah, na'udha illallah, that we worship none but Allah. Hope that answers the question.